Okay, so we were discussing about uh, what happens if we put capacitance. First, we discussed what is the sources of capacitances. And uh, I mean, to be honest, for the purpose of this course, you don't need to know what is this, uh, what are these C ox times overlap and all those things. Those values will be given to you. But the stuff that you need to know is how these capacitances behave if I scale the device. Right? If I, for example, if I say I scale uh, the device in such a way that I mean, I know that uh, the output resistance is dependent on length, right? So I increase length, output resistance increases. Then I know that if I only increase length, the GM will, will get changed. So that's not a good thing. So I want to keep GM unchanged, so I increase GM also. So let's say I doubled both L and W. So R out increases, good. GM remains unchanged, good. But with respect to CGS, what is happening to CGS? The gate to source capacitance. So CGS is, is this. So this will go by approximately by a factor of four if I neglect the overlap capacity. Right? So that is one penalty that we pay. I will see why I am calling this a penalty later on. But for example, CGD, if the transistor in bio, is biased in saturation, uh, if I say if I double L, nothing happens to CGD. But if I double both W and L, CGD goes up by a factor of that doubling. It doesn't go up by 4x. So the stuff that you should understand, I'm not saying remember. If you remember the structure of the MOSFET, this naturally comes. But if you have to remember, you have to remember what are the, how does these capacitances scale as I scale various aspects of the device. Okay. Okay, fine. So, so having said that, let's see the consequences of these capacitances. So as a circuit designer, we are more interested in understanding what are the consequences. Question? Okay. So like, like always, we start from common source amplifier. So again, the simplistic case, I'm not showing biasing. And we can as well now shift to active load all the time. So this is what our scenario was. I forget about RL also. So till now, if from whatever we have done, if the circuit is connected like this, and here I have applied VP sine omega naught T, the output I will get gain times that VP sine omega naught T, right? So it is expected the output will be, in this case, minus GM1 times RO1 parallel R naught 3 times VP sine omega naught T. So there is no frequency dependence of the output, right? So the output is independent of omega. Right? So when I say the output is independent, independent omega, what I mean is the output amplitude is independent of omega. So if I draw a frequency response of this, basically if I draw a Bode plot, if I draw the magnitude response with respect to omega, this is V naught mod of V naught over VI. So this should look like constant and the value of the constant is gm1 r01 parallel r03 right so this is this is trivial but let's see what is happening when i when we include the capacitances so when we include the capacitances so let's say cgs we have the first capacitance is cgs for cgs1 for the transistor m1 let's call this cgs1 uh, then we have CGD, then we have CDB, then we have CSB, body is rounded, so I can round all these. Similarly, for M3, I have all the same capacitances that we have for this case. And so on, right? So I'm not showing the source to body. Uh, let's show that as well. Okay. So at a first glance, this might look very complicated, but by now you should know that 
we have ways of simplifying circuits, right? So that's what we'll take, we'll pause and then see whether uh, this is as complicated as it looks or it is much simpler. So as it turns out, you see that most of these capacitances are referred to ground, right? So let's start off with CGS1. So if I start simplifying, So CGS1 is referred to ground. So with respect to uh, with respect to whatever is happening to this gate to source voltage, CGS1 doesn't have any role to play, right? So I can as well remove this. Okay. Note that I can only remove this if the source resistance is zero. If the source resistance is not zero, then I cannot remove uh, the CGS, right? So let's start off with CGS source source resistance to be zero. And then we'll see later on what are its impact you know, in the presence of source resistance. What about CSB? So you'll have CSB. So body is grounded. So do you think CSB will play a role? Source is grounded, body is grounded. A capacitance between source and two grounds, as well as not being there. Right. So I can get rid of that. There is a CGD for now. I'll ignore the value, the effect of CGD. I mean, as it turns out, the value CGD capacitance is not the dominant capacitance because it's overlap capacitance, right? It's, so I can I'll ignore it for the time being. It cannot be ignored all the time, but let's ignore it for uh, this initial part of the discussion. CDB. So there will be a CDB capacitance here. So CDB is, I cannot ignore because one of the terminals is connected to the output, but the good thing is that the other terminal is connected to ground, right? So I'll keep it as is. Uh, what else? There is nothing for M1. What about M3? Same thing for M3. So you'll have one capacitance here, which doesn't have a role to play because this goes off. The input is biased. There is a CDB capacitance for M3, which will be there because uh, one side is connected to the drain, other side is connected to the incremental ground. That is fine. What about CGD? In this case, also we can ignore, but we see that the CGD capacitance, one, others, I mean, one side is connected to this output terminal, but the other side is also connected to a ground. Right, so I can keep it because I mean it's it doesn't harm uh, it it doesn't add any extra mental load for uh, to uh, to keep this capacitance right. Similarly, CSB goes to zero. So effectively, what we end up with are these three capacitances. But the good thing is, all these three capacitances are one terminal of them is connected to V naught, and other is referred to ground. Right. So so essentially. For all practical purposes, this reduces to a load capacitance where CL is equal to CDB is one three plus CDB three plus CGD three. So I am I should write, I'm neglecting CGD1 as of now. We'll include CGD1 later. So now this becomes quite simple then. The analysis of this. So, so now if I have to find out what is the output what is the transfer function between VI and V0? What will that be? So in the absence of CL, what will the transfer function be? Minus GM1, R1, parallel R3. Now when I, when I have CL, what will the transfer function look like?
So again, I can, so all of these are referred to ground, right, essentially. So this is R01 parallel R03. Right? So the incremental current, the short circuit current is still GM time, GM1 times VI. Right? So this current is still GM1 times VI. And the load now changes from being purely resistive to a parallel combination of a resistor and a capacitor. Right? So your V0 will be then. V0 will be minus GMVI times this R01 parallel R03 parallel 1 over SCL. Right? So it is more conveniently written in terms of conductances. This becomes G01 plus G03 plus SCL. Okay. So, so the transfer function essentially then becomes. If I replace A is equal to J omega for sinusoidal steady state analysis, this becomes minus GM by G01 plus G03 by 1 plus J omega CL by G01 plus G03. So the reason I'm writing it in this format is the standard way of writing these gains is some some DC gain divided by one plus S by P one or J omega by P one, right? So where whatever whatever is clubbed into A naught is essentially the frequency independent part of the gain. So if I set S to zero or omega to zero, whatever gain I get is is A naught. So that is why the frequency independent part of the gain or the DC gain as we call it is clubbed in the numerator. And in the denominator, we write it as one plus something. Now, when you the good thing is when you write in that form, you naturally gain which is the DC gain and which is the pole of the system, right? So, so that in this case, the pole of the system becomes so P1 uh, is the pole of the system. So pole is at minus G01 plus G03 by CL. Right? So if I compare the magnitude response, if I sketch the magnitude response of V0 over VI in log scale, what should I see? I should see at low frequency, I should see the case where as if the capacitance was not present. Right? So, so this I will still see as G, GM1 by G01 plus G03. But then at very high, at, at after certain frequency, that is at the corner frequency, which is P1, I should see a 20 dB roll off. And what will be the equation of this straight line if I do Bode approximations? When I say Bode approximation, I essentially mean that in this case, or in this case, I can ignore the one I can when I am operating at frequency omega much greater than P1, I can ignore that one plus term. Right? So so in this case, if I ignore the one plus term, so V0 over VI at S greater than P1, mod P1, I should say, becomes minus GM by CL. Because if I ignore this part that G01 plus G03 terms cancel off, and I only get GM over SCL or J omega CL. Okay. So, so naturally at the zero dB frequency or the unity gain frequency, uh, what do you call it in 250? Unity gain bandwidth, unity gain frequency, what is the nomenclature that you use? Gain crossover, gain crossover right? So gain crossover frequency becomes GM over CL. Right, so this is often abbreviated as omega u. Uh, some of you have been referring to w by l as omega by l. Don't do that because it will get confusing because now we have omega for frequency. Okay, so uh, this u uh, subscript u stands for unity gain bandwidth or unity gain frequency, and that is a very important parameter. Right, so why is it an important parameter? It, 
in 250, you must have seen that when I put a high gain system in a feedback, it can tend to oscillate depending on many different things. And the critical part is to figure out what is the response of the system around that gain crossover frequency, right? So, uh, so okay, we'll come to that in, in a few minutes, but before we proceed, so this is the magnitude response, but what is the phase response? The phase response will be to start off with, it will be at 180 because the gain is by default negative, right? And if I, if I ignore that 180 part and we'll say that I start off from zero, I understand there will be 180 offset, right? So if I ignore that 180 part, then the gain starts from zero and then here it reaches what? At P1, what will be the phase lag? Minus pi by four. And then it will go and settle at, at very high frequency, what will be the phase? First order system, very high frequency phase, minus pi by two, great. So, uh, so the stuff that we need to, I mean, the stuff that we need to be, uh, need to, so before I tell you what you need to be aware of, now you should know that we are doing all these things because ultimately this amplifier will go into a feedback loop, right? So in a feedback loop, there are certain things we are looking to uh, achieve. One of the things that we're looking to achieve is to minimize the steady state error, right? So it, by definition, steady state error means that whatever at after you have waited for a long time, let's say you hit a, hit a in, uh, system with a step and you have waited for a long time, you expect the output to reach a steady output, right? A steady uh, expected output. Now it will never reach the exact output that you want. There will always be an error. What is the error dependent on? If I have to minimize the error, what should I maximize? Forget about this, 250. If I have to minimize error, what should I maximize? Gain, open loop transfer function or loop gain, right? So in our loops, right? In Now coming back to 210, in our loop, in, our, in whatever we have been to, in studying, the gain is being given by the amplifier, right? So the loop gain is a function of the gain and the feedback factor also, but the feedback factor is determined by something else. But if you have to maximize gain, you have to maximize the gain of the amplifier, right? And in this case, when you are talking about step response, right? Which means by definition, you are waiting for a long time, right? You are waiting for an almost infinite time to observe where the system is settling. So when you are looking at very long time in frequency, what are you looking at? In a frequency, in time domain, I'm looking at something that is stretched out to infinity. In frequency, what am I looking at? So at, so at zero frequency. So essentially, I am looking for gain around zero, right? So maximizing, minimizing steady state error will essentially boil down to minimizing the DC gain. Oh, sorry, pull down. Minimizing DC steady state error will boil down to maximizing the DC gain. Okay. So when you are considering steady state errors, we don't consider anything that is happening here not required extra information right so if you might have a transfer function which looks very complicated with s cube s to the power four i don't know what but if i if the requirement is to find out steady state error all those information are not required you just put s equal to zero whatever you get you get the gain and then you know the expression of steady state error you find out uh, you plug it in and you find out whatever you get however when we are interested in finding out if a negative feedback loop is stable or not which information am I looking for in a loop gain or in an open loop transfer function? Pardon? Poles. In this case, we have poles at P1, right? In the open loop pole is at P1. There is single pole, open loop pole is at P1. What else am I looking for? Is uh, Does omega u or the u gain crossover frequency have any significance? in determining whether the system is stable or not. So let me write it out in this format. 
So E naught over. So now I am switching to block diagram. Okay. So V naught over V i is one over H. L by L by one plus L, where L is GH. If I, uh, what happens at, so at assume, so this is now L of S, right? So assume at S equal to J omega U, L of S becomes minus one. What can you comment about the system? First things first, when I'm looking, saying L of S equal to minus one, which frequency am I looking at? So again, forget about common source amplifier and stuff. So I'm plotting L. So I get, I get this, this is zero dB line. Let's say this is P1. So I am I am trying to find out that frequency for which L of S is minus L of S is mod of L of S is one, let's say. What am I looking at? Gain crossover frequency, right? So I'm looking at here. So when I say minus one, what does it imply? Phase is 180, right? So then the two things to look at. One is finding out the gain crossover frequency from the magnitude plot. Second thing is finding out the phase from the margin will come later, but from the uh, from the phase plot, right? So, so if we see that at omega u, where a model goes to one, this phase is minus pi, then L is equal to, L of S equal to minus one at the gain crossover frequency. I mean, L equal to minus one means I'm talking about gain crossover frequency. And under that condition, what can you comment on on we not on, comment about the closed loop system? Is it stable or unstable? It is unstable, right? So again, I mean now you should be in a position to appreciate one of the concepts that we had talked about when we introduced two port network for the first time. And that is as follows. So let's say this you have set the system up in certain way. And I have found out this. Bode plot and all those things, and you're in, and I break, I have broken this loop here, and I apply VP sine omega ut, right? But omega u is the unity gain frequency. Okay, what should I expect here? L of S is L of S is minus one. So what should I expect there? Yeah, but there is an inherent minus sign here. So I should expect VP. Sorry, I should get me VP sine omega UP. Yeah, not fine. So because L of S is negative of that. Okay. So now uh, now think what is happening. Now, now let's do a hypothetical experiment. Okay, a thought experiment. This cannot be created, but we can do a thought experiment. Let's say we have a switch here. Okay. So initially this switch was open and this switch was closed. So what is it that this, uh, uh, the input of G is seeing? It is seeing VP sine omega, omega UP, right? Because nothing is getting fed back. By definition, the switch is closed. Now, at any point of time, you can choose any point of time, doesn't really matter. Instantaneously, I open this switch and close this switch. What will happen to this voltage? It should not change, right? So now think about it, what is happening? You have not applied any input, but voltage anywhere in the loop hasn't changed. So for as far as G is concerned, and the naturally output of the G is fed to H, H is concerned, or entire loop is concerned, nothing has changed. It will go on as, as if nothing had changed. You don't have any input, but you have an output. 
and output is uh, moving at a frequency of omega naught or omega u. So your system is oscillating at omega u, right? So this is the classic case of barge hughes and criteria, right? So when you have L, have you heard of this term? Okay, then forget about it. So L equal, when you, if you, if you design a negative feedback system and you don't take care of the fact that at certain omega u, L becomes minus one, this is what is going to happen and it is going to oscillate. Now you might say that I don't want to apply omega u input, I'll apply some other input, then why do I care? But the issue is, it's not totally near control. You have noise across all frequencies, always in any system. Okay, so even if you don't apply any active input, from external sources, there will be noise at those frequencies. It will latch up to the noise and it will keep starting to oscillate. And mathematically, this essentially means that if L equal to minus one, V naught over VI is infinite, right? Which essentially means that if you even with zero input, you are likely to get a finite output. That is a classic case of oscillation. It's an oscillator. Okay. Yes. It is, you are still getting the output at a frequency omega u without applying any input, right? So for, if you black box it, there is no input, but the output is going on at omega u. So it's oscillating, right? In fact, this is how oscillators are made, right? You, you impose this condition. I mean, when you are trying to make an amplifier, you try to stay away from this condition. If you're trying to make an oscillator, you try to impose this condition. Okay, and as it turns out, for first-time designers, when you try to make an amplifier, you end up making an oscillator. And when you start to make an oscillator, you end up making an amplifier, right? So, so that uh, that's I mean, that, I mean, keeping that aside. So, when you are trying, at least when you are trying to design something, you have to you know you need to know what you are aiming for, right? So, this is something. This is this is a bare minimum thing that you have to aim for. So, but. One of the good things about first order system is you will never reach this point, right? Because you will never reach a phase of 180. The maximum phase lag is pi by two, right? You will never reach a phase of 180, so you are safe, right? But the bad thing about the first order system is you probably will not get enough gain, right? So you can use a common source amplifier with an active load also, right? You probably will get so now you should be able to appreciate what are the issues, right? So I use a common source amplifier. This gain is minus GM1 by G01 plus G03. And this gain crossover frequency is GM by CL. Okay. So now I want to increase the gain. What can I do? I can keep on increasing the length of the transistors, right? Gain is GM times RO. RO I can increase by increasing the length of the transistor. But increasing RO causes GM to, I mean, increasing the length causes GM to drop. No, I'm DC gain I'm talking about, right? The aim is to increase DC gain because I want to minimize steady state error, right? So I want to increase DC gain in a common source amplifier. What are the handles? Basically GM times RO. RO, I know I can increase by increasing length, but only increasing length hampers GM. So I will increase both W and L, right? If I increase both W I L up W and L, I understand the gain goes up, DC gain goes up, but I'm also increasing the output capacitance, right? So, so the C L also increases. So essentially this omega U shifts to the left, right? So if you keep on increasing, if you keep on increasing the length, so you'll probably have, you can probably get a larger gain, but you will see the omega U. CL, because CL has increased, so entire thing will move to the left. Now you might say, so what, right? Still stable, so what? The so what answer lies in the, in, uh, in the understanding of how the, the gain crossover frequency or the UGB of the closed loop system translates to the response of the open loop system, right? So again, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a log diagrammatic perspective, uh, let's say V naught over V i is one over H L by one plus L, where L is a first order system. So well, L, let me write it as some A naught by one plus S by T one. Okay. So if I write L equal to A naught by one plus S by T one, what is the gain crossover frequency approximately? So 
So I'll sketch model. So what is the DC gain? A not A times B one. A times B one. So DC gain is A not, right? First pole is at P one. Equation of this line using Bode approximation is I can ignore this one. This becomes A not P one by S. So the crossover happens at a not P one, right? So, so this I'm not sure whether you have heard about this. This is called the gain bandwidth product, right? So, uh, so anyhow, so, so now the question is: This is an open loop system, but ultimately I'm looking at. I would like to look at the closed loop system. I would like to understand how the closed loop system behaves. So, so that's why V not over V i is sometimes expressed in this format. So that it becomes easy to pull the algebra. If I write it in this format, you see this becomes one over h by one plus this a naught by one plus s plus p one becomes one plus s by p one over a naught, which essentially means If A naught is much greater than one, right? That's what we are targeting anyhow, right? We want to minimize steady state errors. We are targeting large A naught. If A naught is much greater than one, then this approximately becomes equal to one over H, one by one plus S by P one times A naught, which is omega U, right? Okay, so this is the closed loop. This is the closed loop transfer function. When L of S is A naught by one plus S by P one, provided A naught is much greater than one. Okay, so, so again, there is a difference between the expressions, which is supposed to be at s equal to zero. What is the gain of L of s? A naught. What that is expected at s equal to zero. What is the gain of v naught over v i? What is the closed loop gain? One over h. Is that expected? It is expected, right? So that's good. But again, this is expected because, I mean, uh, we, we are getting this exactly equal to one over h because we assumed a not to be infinity. Otherwise, there would have been a correction term, right? So, so let's go with that right now. Uh, the other thing is, what is the pole of the uh, open loop system and what is the pole of the closed loop system? Pole of the open loop system is P1. And if I do a, let's use a different color. Pole of the closed loop system. Now, if I have to find out the pole of the closed loop system, where will that be? Firstly, what will be the DC gain? The DC gain is one over H. But where will the pole be? At omega U, right? So an omega U is Omega U is for what? Omega U is the unity gain frequency for the open loop system, right? So this is the Omega U. So essentially, this is what is going to happen. Okay, so for a first order system, so this is important for a first order system, Omega U of L of S translates to 3 dB of closed loop system. Okay. So again, then question might be, why do I care? Yeah, so what? So, so the reason we care is uh, when a system settles, right? So ultimately when a system settles, you apply an input, so this is again
this is the V i t, and I also want to plot a V naught t, right? So if this is an unit step, this V i t is unit step, that is this value is one, one volt, and let's say one over h is two, right? So what is it expected to settle at t equal to infinity? So h is one by two, and assume g h to be much greater than one. So if h is one by two, if the system works properly, what do you expect the error voltage to be? Zero. So what do you expect this voltage to be? Vi. Yeah. Then what do you expect this voltage to be? Two Vi, right? So you are expecting the output to settle to at if vi is a unit step at t equal to infinity, what do you expect the output to settle at? Yes, twice, right? So you are expecting at t equal to infinity to for the output to settle at two volt. Okay, so it will start here and go to two. So it will have a profile. It will have a time profile, right? So it will go something like this. It will never reach two. It will tend to two, and also it will never reach two even at t equal to infinity. There will be a steady state error unless g h is infinity. But the thing that I am trying to get at here is how do you know at what speed it will reach, right? Whether it will go in in this way, or whether it will go in this way, or whether it will go this way. And more importantly, I found that it is going in certain way. I want to make it faster. So what should I do, right? So among so from uh, where was the expression? So from this expression, can you comment on which handle that you see here tells us at what rate the output will settle? Omega u, right? So effectively, this becomes uh, this is a like charging of an RC time constant, right? It will set it, the time constant is in this case equal to one over omega u, right? So think of this as equivalent to an RC an RC circuit, which goes like uh, whose transfer function is one by one plus SRC, right? So this is the time constant, right? So this is exactly of that form. So not only not only the first order system uh, omega u translates to three dB of a closed loop, it also means that the settling time constant is equal to one over omega u, right? So that is why omega u is super important thing in a in a in a negative feedback loop, right? You cannot ever ignore the importance of or overstate the importance of gain uh, gain crossover frequency, even though it looks like just one point in the frequency plot. It determines how fast your system is going to settle. It determines based on its phase response at omega u whether the system is going to settle or not, right? It might also determine for higher order systems you must have done in 250 by now, overshoot, undershoot in a second order system, over damped, under damped, those type of things. It is determined by the margin, right? What is the phase information at omega u? Depending on that, the system settles in certain ways. Okay, so however, the thing that we should remember for the part of this for this part of this course is uh, if you have designed a first order system that is a big if if it's a first order system then the settling time is dependent on one over omega u. number one number two is the closed loop 3 dB frequency is equal to the open loop ugp right or the gain crossover frequency right so essentially so the reason a loop gain is important is because from one loop gain plot, you can derive multiple information of closed loop system, right? Not only how its frequency response is, but also how its time domain response will be. Okay, okay, fine. Any questions till now? No, okay. So now let's, let's think what's going to happen to our Differential amplifier, right?
So again, same, same as before. We try to figure out what is the effect of capacitance. We have done GM, we have done R0. So we need to figure out what is the effect of capacitances, right? So now it seems like we have four transistors to deal with. So how do we go about simplifying our stuff? So let's do the easy ones first. So we'll have a CDB at this output node. All the bodies are grounded. So all the CDBs come in parallel, right? Parallel to ground. So that's good. So I'll just put So CDB1 plus CDB4 goes to ground. That's good. Uh, there is, if I only concentrate on the output node capacitance, what else? I have this CGD capacitance. Let's assume for the time being that VI1 and VI2 are being driven. And just like we have ignored the CGD till now, we'll still, let's still ignore CGD, right? OK, what else? Um, CSB will be there, so there will be a capacitance here, right? So there will be a capacitance here. And this capacitance will be the CGS of M3 plus CDB of M3, right? So you will have a capacitance CGS and you will have a capacitance CDB. They can be grounded. So I'll club them together and this becomes, uh, let me call this C3. Okay. Ah, okay. You are, I think this is what you're referring to, right? Correct. Thank you. Uh, then if I ignore uh, what else, I'll have CDB capacitance again that gets clubbed into C3. So essentially, you see that most of the capacitance get clubbed other than the CGDs, right? CGDs will keep for next class. Uh, so now, the thing that we need to understand is uh, right now, we have three capacitances associated with three different nodes. Can you comment on the order of the system? Third order system, right? One way to figure out is how many independent conditions you can set on each of these, on each of these capacitors. You see that there are three independent conditions that you can set which essentially means that it's a, it's, a, it's a third order system. That is fine. But now third order system is difficult to analyze, right? Uh, okay, so then let's understand under what condition this can be analyzed. So let's say, so here I will request for your understanding of 250 again. So under the condition that we are, we are trying to make a stable system, we are not trying to make an unstable system, can you comment on what the system will look like if our magnitude response is like this? Assume we have all real poles, not imaginary poles. I have one pole here, one pole here, and the UGB is here. Yeah, this is loop gain. Yes, open loop transfer function or the loop gain. You can use that term interchangeably. So can you comment on whether uh, what will be the what will be the phase at omega u? I don't want the exact number. Can you tell me a range of phases? Right? So is it like 90 degree, less than 90 degree, 45 degree, less than 45 degree? Any comments? So I am trying to plot the phase. It starts off from zero, let's say. Then I hit P1, where I hit minus pi by four, right? So then I hit P2, yeah, right? So it will go like this, to the minus pi by two. Then it will go even further. So you will have a phase lag of more than 90 degrees at when you reach omega u. It depends. You cannot really comment exactly, right? So, so now let's make another 
uh, let's uh, try to understand from another perspective. Let's make it extreme, right? So let's assume P1 and P2 are overlapping on top of each other. Okay, so let's make that assumption. Or they are very close by. P1 and P2 are sitting on top of each other. Okay. Uh, so this will be at minus 40 dB per decade. Okay. And now let's assume further, not assume, I mean, we are designing a system for high loop gain, right? So this is, let's say, 100 dB. Call it 100 dB, 40 dB. Which is 100, absolute value is 100, 40 dB. Gain of 100 in linear scale. Okay. So, so now, can you comment on, let's say P1 and P2 is at 1 megahertz. Can you, can you comment on at what frequency will this gain crossover happen? At 10 megahertz, right? Great. In this case, I should write mega radian just because everything is in terms of omega. That shouldn't matter right now. I just write meg. Okay, so now can you approximately tell me what will be the phase at the gain of our frequency? It will be like minus five, minus ninety, minus one eighty, minus forty five. It will be closer to minus one eighty, right? Because I am almost like what right here. I am 10x away, right? I'm 10x away from the gain crossover, right? From the previous two poles. So moment I hit this pole, I get one pole 45, another pole 45, 90, and I am 10x away from the from the next point of interest. So when I'm reaching that point of interest, which is omega u, you will are going to have almost another 90 degree of phase lag. So essentially, by the time or at the frequency of interest, you are hitting. I saw it correctly, so this should look like this, minus pi. Okay, so now can you comment on whether the system is stable, marginally stable, approximately stable, unstable? It is borderline unstable, like it will never reach minus 180 perfectly, you will have a 0.1 degree or something like that it will have, but it is borderline unstable, right? So even though one might argue that it will eventually settle, but it's of no use. Right? So when you are designing, you don't want to design something like this. You would like to design something that cleanly settles, right? It doesn't go, it, I mean, it, in, in time domain, this, this essentially will look like then something will happen and it will eventually settle to whatever after five days. Right? So uh, that's something we don't want. Uh, so, uh, so now going back to the pole P1, P2 thing, if you can curate the location of the poles in order to make this a better settling, what would you like to do? Making a stable system is essentially playing around, around with the location of the poles, right? So let's say I cannot move one of the poles. Let's say P1 is there, it will be there. I can move P2. So what would you like to do with P2? Right? move it either away from, firstly, we like to move it away from P1, either left or right doesn't matter. We have to move it away, right? So if we move it away, what is happening that it's making it a better system? Yeah. Exactly, right? So essentially, Firstly, if P2 is P2 is moving away from this location, this phase will not drop as fast, right? And if I if I am able to, in a best case scenario, if I am able to move P2 somewhere here, way out, so this will go something like this, and then P2 will come. So naturally, I mean, if P2 is like infinitely you know, at infinite frequency, which means it doesn't exist, then obviously it reduces to a first order system, right? 
So that's why what we would like to do always is try to make an make a system which behaves like a first order system. Right? Even if you have a multi-order system, we would like to ensure that the system behaves like a first order system around omega u. So that is an important caveat. If we want the system to behave like a first order system around the gain crossover frequency. If you are able to make a system which behaves like a first order system, when I say behave, how do you know whether it behaves? The only thing I, I would like to see is around omega u, does the, system, does the L of s or the loop gain or the open loop transfer function has a slope of minus 20 dB per decade on it? If the system has a slope of minus 20 dB per decade around the gain crossover frequency, more or less it's a stable system with decent enough margins, right? So margins we'll talk about in the next class. But this is essentially, this essentially will be the, will be the, uh, uh, will be the guiding principles with which we are going to design our systems with transistors and make it stable, right? The whole purpose will be to split the poles in such a way that our system becomes stable. And again, for the nth time, when I say stable, I don't mean absolute stability. I essentially mean something which will settle like a first order system. If it settles like a first order system, we can live with that. It doesn't ring like crazy, which essentially means that the poles have to be in an all pole system. The, if we have multiple poles, only one of the poles need to be below UGB. All the other poles have to be above UGB. If there are more than one pole below UGB, it doesn't behave like a first order system. Right? So we'll try to, in the next class on Monday, we'll try to modify our system in such a way that it behaves like a first order system. Okay. Okay. We'll stop here. Thank you.